Today I'm going to talk about bioactive snake enclosures and how you can set up your own. So in the past six months to a year, I've been doing a lot of research on bioactive snake enclosures. And today I want to talk about some of the bioactive setups I currently have and how I set them up. So the first thing I'll talk about is enclosure size. One of the things I think about a lot when I'm observing my own reptiles is how they utilize their space. In my opinion, you can't have too big of an enclosure as long as you fill it up with plenty of things for the animal to climb on and plenty of enrichment. I just set up this bioactive enclosure for my California king snake and he seems to be loving the amount of space that he has. After dark, a lot of snakes become quite active and they do utilize every bit of space that they have. Next let's talk about substrate. The main two things I think about when it comes to substrate when I'm putting together a bioactive enclosure is the burrowing capabilities and humidity. So for my substrate, I like to dump in at least four to five inches so that the plants can be healthy and the snake also has plenty of room to burrow. Now if you're going for four to five inches, I would recommend putting in five to six inches. That's what she said! <laughs> the reason why is whenever you're misting and the snake is constantly moving things around, it'll start to get packed down a little bit. So far in my bioactive enclosures, I've been adding a 60% soil, 20% moss, and 20% sand mix. My go-to right now for the actual soil itself is terra firma by the bio dude. You could also use terra Terra Sahara for more drier climate species like a sand boa or maybe a hognose for example. Either way, the Terra Firma or the Terra Sahara by the Bio Dude are great substrates. They hold humidity and they hold burrows very well. Now one thing I like to do whenever I add my substrate is make sure I also mix in some leaves and some moss. I lay down a light layer of leaves and a light layer of moss and then I just mix that completely into the soil with my hand. When you have that overhead heating and lighting, that top layer of substrate is going to get a little more dry. So whenever you add in the moss and leaves and mix that into the soil, that creates little pockets of humidity so if your snake gets a little too dry from above, it can burrow down and have a humid pocket. If you are using the Terra Firma or the Terra Sahara by the Bio Dude, I recommend using a packet of Bioshot. They have a packet that's for the 36 quart and then they have one for the 6 quart as well. This adds beneficial microorganisms and nutrients to your enclosure. Now what I like to do whenever I'm adding these different layers of substrate is to spray down the enclosure completely after adding each layer. So once I have my 60% soil, 20% moss, and 20% excavator clay or sand all mixed in, I add a layer of leaves that I leave on the top. So I've tried peat moss in the past, just peat sphagnum moss, and honestly I don't recommend it. You can get huge bricks of peat moss for pretty cheap, so it seems appealing and it clumps up really bad. So I don't recommend using peat moss. I would just use the stringy kind of sphagnum moss. Next I want to talk about isopods and springtails. Isopods and springtails are what you're going to use for your cleanup crew. When it comes to what type of isopods to use, I have had good luck with using dairy cow isopods. I currently have just powder blue in some of my enclosures. I have just the dairy cow isopods in some, and I have a couple of enclosures that do have the dairy cow isopods, but also the powder blue or powder orange isopods. So in this 4x2x2 enclosure, for example, I've added about 24 isopods. These are powder blue and they seem to be thriving. Dairy cow isopods are bigger, and that's why a lot of people recommend them for snakes because they can clean up a bigger mess. When I first introduced isopods to my Amazon milk frog enclosure, I had no idea how much they would love the cork flats. I have a pretty large sized cork flat at the bottom of my enclosure, and when I flipped it over, I couldn't believe how many isopods were underneath it. Isopods seem to love these cork flats, so I would recommend adding one of these to the bottom of your enclosure and add a pretty good sized one. When it comes to springtails, start with maybe one to 200 springtails and go from there. So now let's talk about plants. With my bioactive setups so far, I've enjoyed adding pothos, pothos, however you say it. I say pothos, it just seems more fun to me. It's whatever. I'll add the species and the actual name of the plant here where it's dark, I don't know. So the pothos that I've added to my enclosures seem to be really hardy. They've done really well in pretty much any conditions. Some of my enclosures have a little bit higher humidity than others, 
and with both they've done fine. In fact, I have one enclosure that doesn't have any LEDs on it yet and these plants have seemed to do completely fine just with a little bit of sunlight from the window. Ferns are another option. I will say if you're adding ferns to your enclosure, they seem to be a little bit more tricky. Mine have wilted a little bit from the start and then seem to gain their strength back after a few weeks. The first fern I added to a bioactive enclosure I thought I had completely killed but eventually it started to come back so this is something that you're just gonna have to figure out do lots of research on the specific plants that you're adding to your enclosure and they should be fine I added some ferns to my bioactive king snake enclosure and my California king snake has just been destroying them you want to keep in mind if you add two plants that need completely different environments to one enclosure you might be watering one plant but leaving the other plant alone instead of just spraying the whole enclosure down. When you're doing research on which plants to add to your bioactive enclosure, I'd say it's best to first figure out which species you're going to have in the enclosure, and if you have a drier climate species, you might want to go with some drier climate plants. If you have a more tropical species, you might add some more tropical plants so they can all thrive together. Next, let's talk about lighting and heating. I do recommend getting some full spectrum lights for your enclosure. I like to use the strips instead of these spiral bulbs just because they cover a bigger area. I do recommend getting these solar grow lights from the BioDude. Now, there has been quite a bit of talk in recent years about whether or not snakes need UVB. I say, why not? Go ahead and add a UVB strip. I've been using the Arcadia Shade Dwellers and I highly recommend these lights. Let's talk about heating for these animals. For me personally, especially for animals that don't get very big whenever they're adult, I like to use these halogens in a dome. Now I hook up this dome to a dimmer and then I plug that dimmer into a timer. You don't have to have a timer of course but then you just have to remember every day to turn your lights on when they're supposed to be on in the morning and then to turn them off at night. There are some really good options on Amazon for these digital timers that have apps and they work awesome. So there are a couple different ways you can make sure you get just the right temperature. I like to use the halogens because they put off both IRA and IRB, which are the strongest forms of infrared heat. If you use just a ceramic heat emitter, that's fine, but the heat doesn't seem to actually penetrate the skin very much. A ceramic heat emitter only puts off IRC, which is the weakest form of infrared heat. One other thing I'd like to use, and I want to make sure this is clear, I don't recommend buying these heat rocks. From what I've heard, they just get out of control a little too easily, so I don't recommend that. But if you have a piece of slate or a piece of rock that you could put under that hot spot, as long as it's not getting too hot, that's a good spot to absorb warmth, and it's a good naturalistic type of hot spot for your animal. Let's talk about humidity and watering. For your humidity, it depends on the species, but for my corn snake, I like to keep it around 60-70% with little spikes throughout the day. Now, I mimic what they would see in the wild by giving them these humidity spikes whenever it might be raining. I spray down my enclosures about once a day, but like I've said with many of these other things, it depends on the species and what humidity you're going for. I do recommend reptophiles for deeper care guides, and so you can figure out what humidity you want, what temperature you want, and what substrate you're using. You don't want to get these enclosures too soaking wet because then you can start to get root rot with your plants and other problems. Your snake might get a respiratory infection if it's too high in humidity or too low. You might drown your isopods with too much watering. So I would say let the top layer completely dry out and then spray it again. Now I don't get my enclosures just soaking wet but I do spray the entire enclosure down usually at least once a day. Now if my plants start to wilt a little bit and it seems like I'm spraying too much I'll skip a day or two. Now I do want to talk about just leaves for a second. You can buy leaves online or in pet stores, but they can get quite expensive. So what I personally like to do is to go out with a box, collect a lot of leaves, I isolate those leaves for a couple of weeks, and then I either boil them or bake them. If you Google this, there are many different options, different recipes for how to bake leaves or to boil them and disinfect them so you can add them to your enclosure. If you're baking the leaves in an oven, obviously you want to watch that pretty closely. What I've done recently is baked my leaves at about 150 degrees or a pretty low setting for about 15 minutes. The important thing about leaves is it's not only a hiding space for both your snake and especially your isopods, but it's also food for your isopods. These biodegradables help with not only your plant life, but with your isopod life, and it helps the whole enclosure look more naturalistic. Now if you're getting wood or cork bark or these different items from the outside, you'll also want to bake those. These sticks, for example, I just got from a few blocks away from my house, but I did bake them, I washed them, and made sure they were disinfected and cleaned before introducing them to my enclosure. 
Now let's talk about hides. If you set up your hides correctly and properly, your animals will become more confident. I've definitely noticed this with my animals whenever I switch them from Aspen to a bioactive substrate with hides that are buried. They seem to become more confident and come out more often. With my California King Snake, once again, once I switched him from an Aspen substrate to a bigger enclosure that's bioactive with a deep layer of soil, he seemed to become more confident. He comes out every day and baths, he climbs all over the sticks and everything at night, and honestly, his health has seemed to improve both physically and mentally. He's more active and alert, and he seems to enjoy the enclosure so much more. Now, I recommend switching it up. Have an enclosure that has several different hides in it. You can have a bigger hide where there's more space for the animal to move around in, but make sure you also have a hide somewhere in the enclosure where the animal feels snug and secure. Try to create a smaller opening to the hide, even if the hide is a little bit bigger. I also recommend not just putting a hide on the warm side and the cold side. Put them throughout the enclosure, especially if you have a bigger enclosure, why not? When it comes to the water bowl, this is something I've struggled with a little bit, and I'll add some B-roll here of my water bowls. They're not the best, they are artificial, but it works. As long as you keep them clean, keep the water fresh, I think it's fine. Do plenty of research before setting up a bioactive enclosure. There are certain issues that you can come across, like fungus gnats, for example. So you wanna make sure that your enclosure is getting plenty of air, it's getting the right amount of humidity, not too little, not too much. And honestly, this is something you just have to mess around with a little bit to get it just right. Hopefully a few of the things I've talked about in this video help you set up your own bioactive enclosure. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe, comment, give me some ideas for what you use in your bioactive enclosure. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.